Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Heather Harris, and I'm the Educational Programs Manager here at the Art Museum of West Virginia University. Welcome to those of you who are joining us in person and those of you who are joining us virtually. For those of you joining us virtually, we do have live captioning available. So if you would like to click that button on your Zoom uh, interface and avail yourself of that option, you're more than welcome to. Also, we will be taking questions both from the live audience and the virtual audience at the end of our speaker's presentation. For those of you who are joining via Zoom, we will use the Q&A function rather than the chat function um, at that time. All right, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker. Sam Hensley is a junior art history major and his research area is the art and mythologies of pre-Columbian societies in the Americas. I came to know Sam last summer when he was the inaugural Jack Novitz intern at the Art Museum, where he got a holistic view of museum processes and was an invaluable asset to the education programs and the curatorial team. It was a real pleasure to work with him he has distinguished himself as a student, and it was also, I would like to send a tremendous amount of gratitude to the Jack Novitz family for sponsoring this internship and providing this opportunity for students. All right, without further ado, I give you Sam. All right, thank you so much, Heather. So as she said, I was fortunate enough to be chosen as the first Jack Novitz summer intern this summer at the museum. And, you know, I had a really wonderful opportunity to kind of learn about really everything that goes on at a museum and kind of find my place in that world. And, you know, when I was first asked to give one of these talks, I was able to pick really anything currently on display at the museum to talk about. And, you know, to be completely honest, I am not a specialist in contemporary art at all, <laughs> but I was really interested in kind of the international context of this show. And I really felt like there were some interesting discussions to be had surrounding this work. And as Heather mentioned, the majority of my research focuses on non-Western cultures. So kind of that fusion of East and West was another thing that I was really interested in here. Another aspect of art that I'm really interested in is just kind of the way that art can act as a vehicle for communication and the transfer of ideas, you know, especially in this more global world that we live in today. In its best form, you know, art transcends language barriers and crosses borders and really acts as kind of an anchor point for conversations between people from any walk of life. And you know, in my opinion, that's really one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable things that art really kind of provides to our society. And in many ways, Robert Rauschenberg really exemplified the role of the artist as this cross-cultural mediator. International travel was a really important part of his latter career, and it kind of formed this international project called Rocky, which I'll talk a little bit about later. So his vast body of work is essential to any talk about contemporary art, right? Over the years, he experimented with nearly every form of art imaginable, and he was really particularly drawn to photography, especially in his later life. He was most known for his combine paintings, which are a combination of found objects placed onto a canvas. And that name combine really is taken from this idea of combining two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. And the really objective of this was to bring kind of mundane things into this realm of fine art. And he really wanted to solidify this goal he had of making art more accessible and inclusive of everyday people. Photography really started to be recognized kind of more seriously as a, a fine art medium during this kind of post-modern period. And, you know, Rauschenberg took to it really quickly. Many of his early works had, you know, photographic printing techniques and employed techniques that were inspired by the use of photography. In a letter from 1981, Rauschenberg wrote, my preoccupation with photography was first supported by a personal conflict between shyness and curiosity. The camera functioned as a social shield. And, you know, I was really interested in this sentiment. I think, you know, walking down the street carrying a big camera, especially in the 80s, when a camera was like massive, I mean, it make people stare at you more, if anything else. But I take this to kind of mean that he is using this camera as maybe a way to understand the people around him and take them back to his studio and kind of contemplate on them more rather than directly interacting with them. So a key characteristic of postmodern art of which Rauschenberg was a part 
is this kind of percolating desire to bring art and life closer together. And Rauschenberg's work is really a perfect example of this idea. You know, if we want to kind of trace the origins of this, we see the human condition and, you know, individual experiences really become a stable subject for art in the modern period with things like surrealism and expressionism. But then our postmodern artists like Rauschenberg really kind of take this a step further with kind of abstraction devices and adding ambiguity to their work that allows viewers to place their own experiences into the art. And although pieces like the combines and the white paintings that I are kind of like really, oh, the white paintings, they're these paintings that are painted purely white. And to me, that's kind of where this art and life is really evident in his work the most. And I think, so the way that those were meant to be viewed was you're standing in front of the painting, right? And it's completely white. And so you see things like shadows and specks of dust kind of going across them. And then you're pushed to really re-engage with the space around you and think more about what's going on in the real world than being so zoomed in to this kind of static artwork on the wall. And so pieces like those in the combines are really what kind of gave Rauschenberg his initial prominence, right? But in his latter career, he really became focused on this idea of intercultural exchange and he took many trips abroad. So the first trip that he took to China served as the initial inspiration for the Rocky Project I mentioned earlier, which stands for Rauschenberg Overseas Cultural Interchange. So essentially the goal with this project was to expose people to different forms of art in places where, you know, for one reason or the other, they hadn't been exposed to them in the past, things like censorship and kind of more government pushed art styles, right? So the Rauschenberg Foundation website describes that project as a tangible expression of his long-term commitment to human rights and to the freedom of artistic expression. So basically he's traveling to expose people to these kind of new developments, particularly in Western art, you know, as I said, in places where people had not been made aware of them for one reason or another. But I really think what ended up becoming the major part of this is this sort of reciprocal element back on him as well. You know, he created artwork that was influenced by each of these places and he would later return to them to put on the Rocky exhibitions. And then this kind of larger project ended up becoming really more of an inspiration on him than anything else. And before I talk any more about Rocky, I wanna point out that these artworks that I'm gonna talk about shortly were not part of a Rocky exhibition, right? But the trip that he took these on was the same trip that ended up becoming that inspiration for Rocky. So I think it's a little, it's interesting, right? To think about this maybe through a more contemporary lens. You know, today there's a lot more conversations about things like cultural appropriation and, you know, versus appreciation things like that than there were in the 80s, right? But even at the time, there were people who saw this project and kind of were confused by it. So on the reverse side of this wall over here, we have a quote from the Washington Post at the time that called Rauschenberg an art imperialist. Now, I don't know that I would personally go as far to say that he was an imperialist. I think that's, you know, a little heavy of a word for this. But, you know, I think there's a really interesting and important discussion to be had here if we kind of think about maybe where the line exists between, you know, opening up communication and exposing people to new kinds of art, but then on the flip side, kind of pushing your personal ideas on a group of people, right? You know, the main thing that this kind of brings to mind for me in a contemporary, I guess, context is this kind of idea of the white savior that we see a lot lately, you know, people going to countries that they view as less fortunate and then taking it upon themselves to kind of rescue them. I think at its core, you know, the goal of spreading artistic awareness and freedom is perfectly wonderful and noble, right? But, you know, where people start to kind of question it is when we kind of think about how that's being done, I would say. So if we want to evaluate this project, we have to think about, you know, what ideas are being pushed, right? How those ideas are being pushed. And then I think in cases like this, really kind of the lasting impact that they've had on these cultures. You know, I really kind of, as I said earlier, I don't think that he was traveling to these places, you know, with this express purpose of like indoctrinating these artists with his own personal style, right? Or trying to go there and completely squash out any kind of native convention. Like to me, that was just not the point of this. I think what ended up happening was really more of an influence back on him from this project. And kind of, especially when we see like in the Lotus series and the rest of this kind of exhibition, and influenced by other 
kind of visual vocabularies on his, especially really his later work. And, you know, I think it's always worthwhile though to approach anything creative with a degree of healthy skepticism, right? You know, I think really the most productive and interesting conversations come when we kind of look at things that are creative really through a more critical lens, especially huge projects like this. And really museums have a key role in facilitating these kinds of discussions. So the choice to include that art imperialist quote over there was intentional on the museum's part. And this is one of the many things that I was able to participate in this summer. So I spent a bit of time working with our director, Todd, drafting these didactic labels and kind of, you know, discussing what we should and shouldn't include in them. And I think, you know, learning how to present information in a way that it's both accessible to people, but also thought provoking was really one of the most important things I was able to learn here this summer. And I personally feel very strongly that museums should be accessible to everyone, right? And I think the best way to really invite all people from all walks of life to engage with art is to really kind of be sure we're striking that balance between providing necessary background information, but also you know, leaving it open for interpretation and letting people think for themselves. And especially at the end of the day, when it comes to a project like this, you know, nothing is black and white. There are good parts of this, there are bad parts of this. And searching for that kind of, yes, it's good, no, it's bad answer, it's not worthwhile. And I think museums really provide the best space to come in and really sort of sit with these things and think about them and, you know, have these discussions about them. So one of the reasons I'm putting so much emphasis on Rocky, as I said earlier, is that these photos were taken on the trip to China that ended up inspiring Rocky. Um, but another reason I was drawn to this photo series is, you know, these are part of a much larger set of photographs, I believe about 500 in total, and they served as the source material for the rest of the photos in this show. So that was one element of these that I thought was, you know, provided an interesting dialogue between the other prints that are up and these photos kind of serving as the background for everything else that's up. And, you know, I also really just love how candid all of these are. I think, you know, there's wonderful things we can pull out of them and narratives we can kind of draw ourselves, you know, from these really relatively simple pictures. And I think, as I said, you know, these were indirectly the inspiration for what became a massive international art project. And, you know, if I'm being entirely honest, out of this entire show, I think that this series is the most likely to be glance fast, right? I think all of these other collages are really a lot more eye-catching, but I think it's really worthwhile to spend some time with these. So to kind of start talking about actual art at this point, our first photo I'm gonna talk about is this one here called Lamp and Phone. And, you know, when Heather and I were first talking about this, we both thought that this was like, the most immediately eye-catching. And I'm really curious to know if any of you guys feel the same way about it. So one of the most significant experiences I had here while I was working was helping Heather to give tours to summer school groups. And th this was definitely the most uncomfortable portion of my summer, if I'm being honest. You know, I'm not really a public speaker by any means, and I definitely do not have experience with children by any means either. So this was the hardest for me to prepare for and the most out on a limb I think I had to go. But I'm really glad I got to have that chance because, you know, now I feel exponentially more comfortable talking about art and, you know, disseminating this information to a wide variety of people because, you know, if you can talk to kids about it and get them to understand it, you can talk to anybody about it. So in the spirit of that, I kind of wanted to pause for a moment here and have a little bit of a gallery tour time. So I wanted to ask all of you, what are some things about this photo that make it interesting or maybe some thoughts that it brings up for you? Oh, I didn't even notice that. I love that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Mm. Okay. So, oh, did you have one? Oh, yes, yes. So Megan said, this is the only one with artificial light in it. Um, Dr. Snyder said that the light from the lamp kind of creates this warm pool around the photo. And then Karen said, 
What did Karen say? Oh, the cord was wrapped around the phone. Oh, Heather has a comment as well. Yeah. So Heather said that this photo also kind of implies an absence of a person who turned this light on or who is getting ready to answer this phone. So I want to take a second to kind of lay out what's visually present here, which we've kind of already done. But we've got what looks to be probably like a hotel room or something like that with two beds on either side of a nightstand and a illuminated lamp on top. So taken at face value, right, this is a really pretty a simple image. We don't have to do any kind of like visual digging to figure out what's going on here. And it's not, it doesn't really look to be presenting anything to us that it's not inherently doing, right? But I think that this piece benefits from a bit of deeper consideration. You know, as I said before, this kind of undercurrent connection between art and life had really taken hold by the 80s when this was taken. And it's something we really have to remember to consider. So in this piece in particular, I think that's kind of really been employed in this wonderfully narrative way. So as Heather kind of mentioned, for starters, the fact that this lamp is still on suggests somebody's presence and that somebody has either just been here or is just outside the frame or something like that, right? Um, but, you know, I think it's kind of fun to start to construct a bit of a story around this in your mind, right? So I wonder if anybody has, what, what kind of a narrative does this suggest for you? Yeah. Megan said, this is Rauschenberg's hotel room, and he stays there. <laughs> Wonderful. And it's a cue. It's not mm. It's uh, the point of view of the artist. Rather than um, when I might choose. Right. Dr. Snyder said that the point of view in this is a little bit askew and it gives us this idea that it's the point of view of the artist rather than really anything else. And it kind of adds that sort of personal element to it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's implied work. It makes me think of it as a water, which is okay. police officer or something. Okay. So Heather said that this implies kind of like a film noir where there's like a police officer or detective or somebody like that, that there's like impending danger or something or maybe impending action. So for me, I actually feel like this picture feels awfully lonely, right? I get kind of the notion from this that maybe somebody's waiting into the late hours of the night next to this phone that's just not ringing. But I also think when you look at this a little more closely, there's some kind of reflections along this back wall that maybe look like daylight coming in. So then to me, it kind of turns into you know, this person's just woken up and, you know, what's waiting for them in the world ahead today? And, you know, what kind of a day are they going to have? And something really simple like that even. But, you know, the truth is, this was most likely just a quick snapshot that Rauschenberg took, and he probably wasn't looking to hide this much of a deeper meaning in it, right? But I think it's still interesting to pull that out kind of regardless, because, you know, even if he's not intentionally hiding it in there, it's still there if we're able to pull it out. And I think that kind of gives us insight into maybe kind of subconsciously what he's thinking about at this time. And, you know, what elements, I guess, make one thing more worthy of being photographed over another, right? And I think above all, it's just really interesting just how much can be suggested just from a picture of a lamp on a table, right? I also want to point out before I move on that for the most part, all of these photos are set in outdoor spaces, and this is the only one we have that is set indoors. So, you know, for one thing, I think that's really just kind of necessary to set off a bit of a dialogue between all these pieces. And even from there, I kind of start to think of this as being in somewhat of a timeline, maybe. This is kind of at the end of a day or at the beginning of a day, and then all of these are, you know, Rauschenberg's travelogue and things that he's seeing during the day and all the places that he's going. So the next photo is called Hanging Silk. And like the lamp in the phone, I think this does, you know, a really wonderful job of turning something more mundane into an interesting artwork. So, you know, if we were to walk past this on the street, as eye-catching as these wonderful fabrics are, you know, it's probably pretty typical for where it is. You know, I get the idea that this is some sort of like an outdoor market or something like that. And, you know, this would be a scene like most of the ones around it. 
But I think that's really one of my favorite things about this series is kind of the power that it has to turn something relatively every day into something that we need to stand here and kind of consider more deeply. And so another thing to point out is that this is the only one we have here that has a human figure in it, right? So if Rauschenberg is so concerned with connecting art and life, why is there only one photo that's showing us a person? You know, I really think that in a way, these ones that don't have a person in them almost do a better job of connecting art and life than just showing us a person. Because, you know, now we're standing here and contemplating things about them that could have just been shown to us outright. With this picture, you know, it's very clear that this is somebody buying or selling silks at a shop, right? But any of these other ones, you know, we're able to kind of like we did construct narratives around them and then put our own thoughts into them and really kind of make it more personal for us, which I think is really more about this sort of, I think that's more representative of this postmodern style than this is truthfully. And I think, you know, that's the wonderful thing about these. And so coming back to this piece specifically, like I said, it's not difficult to figure out what's going on here. It's very clearly a person at some sort of market, right? But I think the way this one serves this series as a whole is to kind of give us this sense of place, right? Most of these could have been taken anywhere, but this one specifically is very clearly immediately recognizable as having been taken in China, right? And so this next photo that I wanna talk about is called Wall, and it's just as recognizable as being taken in China. So for those of you who can't see, this is an image of the Great Wall kind of rolling over the hills here. Um, and you know, in much the same way as these silks, this creates a really immediate sense of place, right? And I think these are both equally representative of China, but at the end of the day, you know, they couldn't be more different, really, in any way. But I think that's such a wonderful reminder of just how multifaceted cultural identity is and just how much really kind of goes into that. And from a purely formal standpoint, you know, when I first look at this photo, it just strikes me as really serene and really peaceful. And I think that kind of interesting element between sort of the interest created, right, by this wall rolling over the hills and the kind of natural landscape above creates an interesting dialogue, especially when, you know, the landscape around this is completely dwarfing the Great Wall. When obviously in real life, it's completely massive and miles long, but in this, it's really just kind of like a blip on the radar. And I think, you know, the way that it makes this symbol of Chinese culture and Chinese people really so minuscule to me is where that art and life connection comes in here, right? You know, it's barely fathomable to represent how many people are included under the kind of umbrella term of people who live in China, people who have Chinese heritage, you know, it's like billions of people across the world, but here, this iconic symbol of them is just completely dwarfed and swallowed up by the natural landscape. And I think to me, that kind of really suggests just how expansive, you know, the world around us is. And also at the end of the day, you know, how kind of trivial cultural kind of divisions can be when at the end of the day, you know, we're just, we're all human beings, we're in the same boat. And just the hostility that goes across those lines sometimes really just is, is so meaningless because at the end of the day, we're all on this same boat, as I said, you know? And I think in a way this also stands in for Chinese art and Chinese culture as a whole. And when Rauschenberg was traveling at this time, I really feel like he undoubtedly saw this as kind of a stand-in blanket for all of that. And to him, I feel like this kind of represents this I guess in his mind, untapped visual culture that he's really immersing himself in at this point. And so another one here that I think does a wonderful job of connecting kind of nature to a more built element is this one, it's fence tree. And I always think when I look at this, that this is just so wonderfully sculptural. Like there's some swirls here, I don't know if you can tell, but they kind of look like clouds maybe or swirling waves or something like that. And I think the combination of natural and industrial here is really interesting, right? So we've got this really old tree surrounded by kind of a chain fence. And personally, one way that I've chosen to think about this is kind of 
as being representative of the way that tradition and older things can persist into you know, the current times and really the protection that we place around things like that, especially you know, in places like museums where the hope is that these things will live on indefinitely to be enjoyed by generations and generations to come. So this summer while I worked here at the museum, I spent the majority of my time working with our wonderful registrar, Karen, taking inventory of the permanent collection. And you know, she taught me so much about proper practices to ensure that works of art are protected and that they'll always exist for generations to come and generations in the future to enjoy. You know, there's just so much more that goes into that behind the scenes aspect of the museum world than I think most people would really realize. But, you know, in my opinion, that's the most important thing a museum does, right, is protect art and serve as a house for it. Because, you know, if we can't do that, if we can't manage to keep it for an indefinite amount of time, then any other conversation about a museum's role in the world is, I mean, it's moot, right? Because if we're not protecting these things and we're not ensuring that they can exist forever, you know, conversations about how we display them, what we display, how we talk about it, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it all boils down to these are things that we have deemed valuable and that we're placing protection around, right? And so kind of coming back to this, I always think we really do treat natural things almost in the same way as artwork, right? Especially really old natural things like this tree seems to be. You know, to me, this kind of brought to mind how up in arms people really get when like somebody tears down a really old tree or they disrupt the natural landscape in one way or another. And I think, you know, especially now with a lot of environmental issues being at the forefront of a lot of discourse, that was one of the parts about this that was really intriguing to me. And thinking again about how Rauschenberg is traveling at this time and just kind of being out and about in the world, you know, the fact that he chose to photograph so many natural things to me really reminds me of, I think this deep connection that a lot of us really kind of feel to the nature around us, you know, especially in this kind of post pandemic, I struggle to say post pandemic, still going on pandemic, but post pandemic world, you know, I know a lot of us have really found refuge in the natural world. And this photo and the great wall photo, I think really just kind of remind me of how healing being in nature can be. And I think that really connection that pretty much, I think I would say most people really feel to nature. And I think just to kind of wrap up, this last photo is another one that kind of brings to mind this connection between nature and culture. So I think this does a wonderful job of combining sort of elements of this natural world with this cultural icon here, this painted silk. And, you know, I really like the connection here between kind of this fabric, but also the landscape it's situated in. You know, we really see the elements on the fabric being echoed in the space around it. And this kind of really brings to mind for me, you know, the ways even more commercial things like clothing and things like that really do echo the space and the environments around us. And also, you know, a lot of Eastern art traditions have this really heavy focus on nature and natural elements in their art. And that's kind of another connection that this brings to mind for me. I think, you know, in the ways that most of these are somewhat set in their times to an extent, this one is the one I would say that strikes me as the most timeless, right? You know, if I didn't already know that this had been put out in 1983, and if color photography had just somehow magically always been possible, I mean, you could convince me that this was taken any time because there's so much focus on nature here and this sort of cultural element that has persisted for a really long time. And I think, you know, it reminds me of how nature is such a timeless and borderless subject for art. You know, I think the ones here that employ nature to me are the ones that do the best job of facilitating that sort of cultural dialogue that Rauschenberg would really soon become so infatuated with. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that no matter who you are or where you come from, most people have some degree of an innate appreciation for nature. And I think that is a really wonderful meeting point for conversation between any group of people. And that's also part of the rest of the series here as well, the Lotus series. At the end of his life, you know, Rauschenberg is clearly finding comfort in returning to this sort of natural symbol of the Lotus and fusing it with the world around him. You know, the beautiful thing I think for all of these photos is kind of 
they're truly open opportunities for personal interpretation. You know, I think we've seen a lot of that today. Everybody here has a different view of these than I do, right? If you stand here and spend time with them, the things that you would point out are entirely different from the things that I point out. And I think that's the beautiful part of this, right? You know, the best artwork really acts as an anchor point for conversations and multiple meanings. And I think that these pieces really do fit that bill. And, you know, truthfully, a few months ago before I came here to work, I never would have thought I'd be standing here today giving an art talk in the gallery. But, you know, my experiences that I had here have really helped me grow as a person. And, you know, especially learning how to talk about art and present about art in front of a wide variety of audiences. And just to kind of conclude here, I, I just want to thank Heather and the wonderful museum staff for being such wonderful teachers and coworkers this summer. And I want to thank all of you for coming and spending your lunchtime with me today. Thank you so much, Sam. And I think for the whole audience, you can understand why we were so thrilled to have Sam as our first Dachnovitz summer intern, because he really set the bar quite high. Um, and uh, before we wrap up, if anyone has any questions for Sam, I will take um, Q&A in the Zoom chat. I think that we have enough space here that if we wanna do live questions, I think that people can step to the microphone. Um, because I've realized that my ability to adequately capture the nuances of everyone's questions and restating them <laughs> is not always up to the task. Um, so I'll be monitoring the chat, but if you have a live question and you'd like to step up to the mic, um, then you can do so as well. All right, is anybody feeling brave or anyone have anything that they wanna ask? All right, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about what this looking yeah. has taught you about your own research. Will you need to travel internationally in order to pursue uh, your art history? Well, to answer that question shortly, 100%. You know, I think traveling, I mean, there's no, ex like, no substitute, I guess is the word I'm looking for, for being in person with these things. But also, I think compared to maybe paintings, European paintings or things like that, that I think we've been kind of trained to see things more deeply in, you know, looking at pre-Columbian artifacts, it, they're visually more simple, you know, and I think they're also kind of, I guess, more practical. Like they're also used rather than just being purely decorative. So I think things like this and standing here contemplating and really trying to pull out these deeper things out of, I struggle to say simple, but simpler visually things, I think is really helpful for me as somebody who's studying that sort of field of art, if that answers. I don't have any virtual ones right now. <laughs> any, any live questions? I guess I am interested, you talked a little bit about um, the kind of museum's role in protecting, and I know that you were really compelled by the time you spent in registration work. And I wonder how that fits into um, your thinking about the objects that you study in your research and how that might give you a new perspective on how you're handling them or how you're accessing them and, and kind of how that experience might tie in. Yeah. So, um... I think especially with pre-Columbian sites, there's a lot of historically like looting and things like that that have happened and really not proper archeological care of these things. And so today it's kind of hard to really fully trace back where they came from or ensure that they've been taken care of as they should, right? And, you know, Professor Light and I recently went to <laughs> Winthrop University in South Carolina to do a short talk on some of their pre-Columbian objects and I swear, Karen would have had a heart attack if she saw the way that these things were stored. I mean, so, I mean, coming there with that sort of background knowledge, I was like, okay, I need to stand here and reorganize your cabinet for you, give me some gloves, because you guys don't have gloves, you're just grabbing them. And so, I mean, I guess, you know, I have more of an appreciation for things like that, but also that sort of foundational knowledge to if I'm going anywhere to study anything, you know, the precautions that you have to take to make sure that you're not going to destroy it. <laughs> All 
All right. Any other questions? Well, come make a comment, <laughs> Professor. Come make a comment, Professor Light. <laughs> All right, so I loved something you said, nature is a borderless subject in art. I think Professor Snyder and I both wrote that down. That was really a beautiful sentiment, I think, talking about these works, because when you were talking about the Great Wall piece, I just was teaching literally what yeah. Qing Dynasty and Han Dynasty yesterday yeah. to the rest of the class as, as coeval kind of civilizations. But I actually thought about like the human toll that the mm -hmm. building of the wall took, like the loss of life. And the idea, though, of possibly, because we've also spoken about Buddhist influence here, right, with the Lotus series and that, you know, how spiritual these landscapes must have been for Rauschenberg to be part of. And so I was actually thinking about Taoism and kind of this escape from the busier cityscapes and into yeah. kind of a, a natural landscape. And so I, don't, I think you're right. I saw something completely different than what you were pulling out. Um, but this idea of really there's a beautiful kind of interchange of, of human life that's both visible and then implied. Yeah. Do you think any of that too? I was wondering. No, what I thought about was, I'm not going to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> What's wonderful about the photograph is you're looking with the artist's eye. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have worked who chose shift things or to have a line a third of the way through you look with the artist's eye. Mm -hmm. I think that's just a wonderful connection really with photography too because it really there's just such an immediacy to it and I think in a way it's really kind of the most intimate of all the art forms I would say because you know as you said I mean we're seeing this as he saw it directly. <laughs> All right, so if we, um, the virtual world's been quiet today. Usually they're <laughs> typing away, but that's okay. There have been a lovely engaged audience online, a lovely engaged audience here. We're so happy that you joined us. Um, just a few notes. We will have our final installment of Lunchtime Looks on the first Friday in December um, with Zach Fowler, who runs the Arboretum here at West Virginia University. And he is going to be looking at our trees on the mountain exhibition, our landscape paintings, and kind of tying his experience with the Arboretum's landscape into the artistic. So that will be a truly um, interdisciplinary talk at noon, the first Friday in December. Um, we also have a special event evening talk with Professor Michael Sherwin next Wednesday, November 10th at 6 p.m., where he is also going to be looking at that trees on the mountain exhibition through the lens of his own photo, uh, photographic work and his new book that he has published, which will be available for sale and signing at that uh, talk as well. And finally, if any of you have young people in your life, this Sunday from one to three, we will have a scavenger hunt in our sculpture garden and hot chocolate on our patio. Um, for our family day, we were trying to find a way to engage families and young people that would still feel safe in this not quite post-pandemic moment that we're in. So it looks like we're going to have sun. You, some of you might have seen the tents being constructed on your way in. So we'll have hot chocolate, we'll have cookies, and we'll have a scavenger hunt where you can find some art supplies. So please, any of you who... And the museum will be open. So you can bring your kids in. You cannot bring the hot chocolate in. That's one of the things that Karen <laughs> talks about. It is, about. yes. Um, but thank you all for joining us. And thank you again to Sam. Really, truly, it was a pleasure. And I'm tremendously proud. I know everyone who's worked with him is tremendously proud. And um, one more note of appreciation to the Jack Nevitz family for sponsoring this opportunity for our students because it's truly, I think, um, I might not be going too far. Thank you. I think that's what I said <laughs> at the end. I would, I would go that far. Thank you all and have a good rest of your Friday. Take care. Thank you all.